Setting. very, very passionate piece. It's not reined in or polite. It's rude and angry and brusque and feral. And these are all things that I would imagine Punch Trunk was drawn to so that they can then give you a meditation on themes of the play rather than a, a, a straightforward transcription of the play. You don't need to have read the play, but you can sense danger. You can sense someone behaving badly. You can sense real tragedy taking place in front of your eyes. Punch Drunk is interesting, I think, because they want to sort of reinvent how we experience theatre, and they want to take it out of the realm of the linear, where something has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I like to use the verb refract it in such a way that it's like kind of sending the event through some sort of prism. And what you get from it depends a lot on what you put into it, where you happen to be at any particular time. It's about opening up ways of seeing and ways of experiencing theater. Don't you understand that? Some people are gonna be annoyed. Some people are gonna be confused. Some people are gonna rush out because they don't wanna be in a dark place. Some people are going to latch onto it very quickly and see everything. And some poor souls are going to be walking around all, all evening and, and practically not bump into anybody because they're just in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, people who know the Duchess of Malfi inside out will have a certain experience, and people who've never read a word of it will be either bewildered or, or excited or pissed off. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the hardest thing for me and also I think for Torsten in terms of the way of writing it, is that we're so conditioned to a narrative that it starts at the beginning and goes from the middle to the end. And that a lot of these scenes are designed libretto-wise to exist as little fragments of something. The company will perform two full loops of the opera, okay. well, we need to giving wandering audience members a chance to catch various plots and subplots no. happening at the same time on different floors. The only way that you can hear everything that Torsten's written is by playing it twice because there's so many simultaneous things and also it gives everybody a chance to see something that they may have missed for the first time. Mm. But how would they know that they'd missed something? They won't. The lock to them is like a foul black cobweb Baritone Richard Burkard is playing Bosler, an assassin hired to uncover the Duchess's secret marriage, then kill her. He's there as a spy. He's been sent in. He's working for, for the brothers. He's got a weight to him, and he's in the know. But he doesn't have that burden of being a figurehead in the, in the family. He's the only character who really has moral qualms about his role. The Duchess's elder brother, the corrupt cardinal, is played by bass baritone Freddie Tong. I am the cardinal, which I have absolute power to control and to do whatever I want, and I am there to basically abuse my power. He's such a sort of classic, malevolent bad guy, but actually he's, like all of them, there's, there's a softness there, and 
it's, it's actually the, there's the pressure and there's corruption of the court that stifled everybody and they're just a victim of their surroundings. The Cardinal is having an affair with a married woman, Julia. She's played by soprano Julia Sporson. I'm married to a guy called uh, Castruccio, which kind of implies that he's impotent and he's old. So in this world, I'm a courtesan. There's a hint of the melancholic about her, and actually just the sense of, um, of loss, and it provides another another take on the emptiness of Malfoy. Duchess is so strong, and even though she's oppressed from all sides, she she deals with it. She's quite stoical about it, and she's tough to the end. She goes and marries Antonio, even though she's not really supposed to. She's really strong, and she just... She, I don't think she ever weakens, really, as a character. Extreme vocally for everyone. It's very high, it's very low, um, it's very difficult to pitch the note. I'm looking through the score, seeing which, which instruments are going to be giving my note. I say, okay, so I've got a beat of clarinet singing my B natural before I sing, so listen out for that. And uh, so that's part of the learning process. So this basically is a um, the full score reduced into something that's meant to be playable on the piano. Um, but most importantly, um, the bits that I'm going to be playing are the key um, moments that they will hear from the band. Um, also, instruments that give them their notes are very important. Um, and again, it's very difficult just to look by looking at the vocal score. It's very difficult to know if there's a, a part that's going to feed them a note, whether it's actually going to be heard or not. That's the other problem. Um, so then we have to dive into the full score and see what it's battling with, um, see if it will come out clearly enough. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking for all of us. Um, every, everybody's being challenged by this piece. If I show nerves, then everyone will um, be nervous. I'm trying to keep them all underneath and just do my job and be as clear as I can and just let them play the music. That's my job to do. Here, talk to the first violinist. 
at all. There. Do you want them to be also and prosh and marcato, or are they a bit more lyrical every time? <laughs> okay, so let's. Okay. Hearing this, uh, which you have heard only in your mind for many months or years sometimes, and then uh, discovering it actually sounds like you have imagined. It's always very exciting. Not only did Rash write the score, he then had to arrange it too, accommodating 70 players moving around three separate floors. No sane composer would potentially put these combinations of instruments together. It's just pure logistics that have, you know, we have a, a finite amount of players and we can't have them running around from tune every scene. So, you know, whoever's in scene two doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily able to play in scene three. So we've got these combinations of orchestrations that have come out of logistical reasons that are like nothing I've ever heard before. And I mean that in a really good way. I mean, I think some of the sounds are completely original. Can I come down so that the flutes can be forte on top? Do you have forte at the moment? Yeah? Yeah. The music is very challenging because it changes all the time. It's so sort of multi-layered. Um, you know, you, you've got to concentrate so hard to, you know, to make this work. I mean, I think it's amazing. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how it works, um, you know, in the performance. <laughs> The team haven't seen the site yet and must choreograph from floor plans. In this opening scene, the Duchess is presented to the court of Malfi. Her brothers have warned the young widow never to wed again. beautiful and that's almost like a freeze when when she does it is great and then the effectiveness of of Freddie being so unimpressed by that then just carrying on saying oh yeah everyone says that for God's sake you know you silly bitch and then you're back to where we were again and it's just trying to make the specialness of her of her entries in here sort of give her that halo of, of nobility to try and sort of set her up as that character that's how I think of it you know, it's always a lesson. 